After going through this lesson, you shall be able to first understand the significance of theorizing FDI flows, explain different theories of FDI, examine the various notions of theories of FDI, provide empirical evidence to support theories and reasons for non-applicability of theory. Two interrelated aspects of FDI have been the subject of much controversy. They are why do firms invest abroad and which location will be chosen and why. Despite wide ranging debate and research, there is no universal approval to either of these questions. For decades, the underlying reasons for FDI were perceived to have been a mix of two opposite forces that is push that is low rate of return at home and pull factors that is higher rate of return abroad. It is the combination of these two forces that work behind the decisions to establish production bases overseas. FDI policy is made in a political and economic context. In recent decades at the global and regional levels, there has been a series of crises in finance, food security and the environment. These crises and challenges are having insightful effects on the way FDI policy is fashioned at the global level. Many hypotheses or theories were formulated to explain the international movement of capital. With this backdrop, FDI and ensuring that it contributes to sustainable development becomes an overriding objective for both home and host countries. As a result, a new kind of FDI theory and policy is emerging which simultaneously takes into account the dichotomy between liberalization which promotes FDI and to regulate FDI in quest of fulfilling the objectives of public policy. Now we have significance of theorizing FDI flows. At the present time, the issue of FDI is being paid more attention both at national and international level. The objective of having a theory is that of preventing the observer from being dissolved by the full-blown complexity of natural or concrete events. As such, theoretical phenomena have two purposes, to organize prudently and communicate clearly. In this note, an attempt has been made to acquaint you with the stance of a broad review of the major existing theories or hypotheses relating to FDI. Attempts have been made by the researchers to theorize FDI flows. Such theoretical studies on FDI have led to a better understanding of the economic mechanism and the behavior of economic goals and agents both at micro and macro level allowing the opening of new areas of study. In this context, one must first understand the basic motivations that cause a firm to invest abroad rather than export or outsource production to national firms. International investment theories endeavor to elucidate why FDI takes place. However, there is no unanimity about having a single theory that encompasses the different types of FDI or the investment made by a particular MNC or country in any region. Kendall Bulger in the year 1969 was of the view that initially direct investment was the only international capital flows. Prior to 1950, FDI was regarded as a subset of portfolio investment and this led to assertion that the difference in interest rates was the crucial factor for capital flows. But this view ignores the essential difference between portfolio and direct investment. Since direct investment involves control and the interest rate hypothesis does not incorporate control aspects of FDI. During 1960s, attempts were made to formulate a suitable justification for FDI flows. Since then, researchers have provided various hypotheses which highlight many and varied factors determining international capital flows. Some of these hypotheses relate to advantages which stem from market imperfections in the form of oligopoly and monopoly position. The studies of McDougall and Camp status that when there was free movement of capital from an investing country to a host country, the marginal productivity of capital tended to be equalized between the two countries. Similarly, Simpson in the year 1962, Frankel in the year 1965, Pierce and Rowan in the year 1966 and Case in the year 1979 hypothesized for international investment flows. Heimer in his doctoral dissertation propounded a systematic approach towards the study of FDI. He built up an imperfect market framework of a firm for the analysis of FDI flows. His approach got support from other researchers like Lemphalusi in the year 1961, Kindleberger in the year 1969, Knick Broker in the year 1973, Caves in the year 1974, Dunning in the year 1974, and White Source in the year 1974, and Cohen in the year 1975. 
since the market is imperfect firms are able to take advantage of their market power to reap good profits by investing abroad however hymer's proposition does not provide a total picture for fdi because it falls short of explaining where and when fdi takes place this has been attempted by vernon plc theory the eclectic approach by dunning and the international theory by buckley and kasson buckley and kasson formulated their hypothesis based on three assumptions the first is firms maximize profits in a market that is imperfect secondly when markets in intermediate products are imperfect there is an incentive to bypass them by creating internal markets and the third internalization of markets across the world leads to mnc's it was during in the year 1993 who articulated one of the most robust and comprehensive theory of fdi he put forward his theory popularly known as eclectic paradigm or oli paradigm he recommended that a firm took an fdi if three conditions of ownership location and internalization were met another hypothesis was proposed in the form of investment development cycle or path this approach accepts the fact that a government can influence the country's condition through its policies thereby affecting fdi flows and domestic firms ownership advantages in this way idp introduced a new nation of dynamic approach to the eclectic theory robert elbers 1970 hypothesis relate to financial factors he believes the imperfections in the foreign exchange markets may be responsible for foreign investment and made an attempt to explain fdi on the basis of the strength of currency however it is not relevant for less developed countries with highly imperfect or non existent capital markets and with heavily regulated foreign exchanges another financially based hypothesis is known as portfolio theory this theory was proposed by rugman agman and lesard they reasoned that international flows allow for a diversification of risk and as a result tend to maximize profit economists believe that fdi is an important element of economic development in the developing countries from a macro point of view fdi is regarded as generator of employment high productivity competitiveness and technology spillovers some researchers viewed fdi may crowd out local enterprises and have a negative impact on economic development from the microeconomic point of view the investors motivation for investment in developing countries are important lipse in the year 2002 concludes that there are positive effects but there is not a consistent relationship between fdi stock and economic growth the positive or negative effects on developing countries may also depend on the nature of the sector in which investment takes place it is important to note that all available evidence indicates that fdi does not promote infrastructure and directly contribute to economic development but does accelerate development in countries that already enjoy high levels of income and infrastructural facilities in this way the relationship between fdi and economic development remains a complex one attempts have been made to relate fdi hypothesis to international trade according to angtard about one third of total international trade occurs between the intra firms a number of attempts have been made to integrate fdi theory with the theory of international trade it was in response to this need that vernons in the year 1966 gave a theory of product life cycle theory it provides an explanation of how factors such as the availability of larger and cheaper capital superior management discovery of new processes product differentiation etc interact over time to determine production export and foreign investment patterns of oligopolistic enterprises mnc's have an incentive to enhance the gains from trade by expanding output or setting up new units in least cost locations and by supplying to all markets from that location many researchers have also attempted to integrate trade theories with direct investment theories fdi along with technology flow remains a conditioning factor for trade flows and its pattern the plc hypothesis appears to have afforded a policy for an integrated approach to trade technology and fdi while introducing product differentiation as well as market imperfection to sum up no single theory can explain international investment however applicability of these hypotheses differ with the type and origin of investment yet all these hypotheses are unanimous in their view that mnc's move to host countries by the objective of 
harvesting the benefits emanating from the advantages in the form of location, firm specific or internalization of markets. In addition, these hypotheses highlight the fact that government domestic policies also play a vital role in encouraging international investment by firms. Some hypotheses have articulated a link between regional trade agreements and FDI. However, in this context, it is pertinent to note the growing importance of MNCs emanating from emerging economies which has necessitated the modification of these theories. Thus, the conclusion emerges from this discussion is that there is not a unified theoretical explanation and it appears at this point very unlikely that such a unified theory will emerge because every new evidence adding some new elements and criticism to the previous ones. Thus, the theory of FDI is indeed eclectic, representing a collection of focuses and drivers. Now we move on to the theories of FDI. While discussing theories of FDI, it is important to recognize Stephen Herbert Heimer's research which is considered to be a milestone in the study of FDI. He introduced in the year 1960 the microeconomic theory of international production. Until 1960s, the basic motive of FDI was search for higher rate of returns. However, over the period, there has been a change in this perception and it has been found that the motives behind FDI investment in host countries have been far more diverse than mere search for higher returns. There have been many theoretical and empirical researches which have identified various factors determining different types of capital flows. Heimer has given two reasons for internationalization of companies. They are in the form of dimension and ownership of specific assets and the existence of market failures. He highlighted that MNCs have firm specific advantages, allowing them to operate profitably in host countries. According to him, the objectives behind FDI are first, the level of control which a firm of home country gets to direct investment in home country. Secondly, market imperfections in the form of the ownership of knowledge not known to the rivals. Third, existence of product differentiation giving profit advantage to a firm investing abroad. Fourth, difficulties related to licensing the product for supporting FDI operations. Thus, according to Heimer, the FDI advantage must be in the form of economies of scale superior technology and greater awareness in marketing, management or finance. FDI becomes possible since these product and factor market imperfections enable the MNC to operate more profitably in host countries markets than can local competitors. Critics have highlighted the limitations of Hummer's proposition because he has first exaggerated the role of structural market failure, secondly ignored the transaction cost of market and thirdly failed to explain the location and dynamic aspect of FDI. Caves in the year 1971 has categorized the pattern of FDI as vertical, horizontal and conglomerate. However, motives of FDI are more complex. Caves identified factors such as possession of superior knowledge or information, motives to avoid uncertainty in an oligopolistic market characterized by a few suppliers and objective of creating entry barriers etc as being responsible for rising FDI flows. Then we have OLI theory of John Dunning. In this study, Dunning in the year 1981 has offered a broad analysis of FDI based on ownership location and the internalization. This is also referred to as the OLI model. Such model is labeled in terms of eclectic theory which is the most widely cited and accepted theory of FDI currently. This theory highlights four benefits that flow from FDI. They are first, the ownership specific advantage that is OSA, the location specific advantage that is LSA, the third internalization specific advantage that is ISA and fourth dynamic add-on advantages. The merits of a significant equity ownership O position lie in the combination of equity ownership rights and management control rights. FDI provides more direct and tighter control over foreign operations. It is widely utilized in knowledge intensive high tech industries such as automobiles, electronics, chemicals and IT. Without FDI, it would be difficult for MNCs to control their licenses to move forward. By and large, ownership advantages enable MNCs to more effectively expand, relocate and influence firm specific potentialities abroad. Location advantage that is L indicate 
to the advantages one firm get hold of when operating in one location due to its firm specific abilities host countries locations possess distinct geographic features which are not available elsewhere and as such a considerable amount of fdi flows to such locations foreign locations become attractive as they offer important advantages to mnc's the ownership o advantages emanate from the possession of particular intangible assets that is asset advantage oa and the ability of the firm to coordinate multiple and geographical dispersed value added activities and to capture the gains of risk diversification transaction cost minimizing advantages that is ot the reason behind mnc investing abroad is to exploit or acquire these advantages the theory of property rights and the internalizations paradigm explains this phenomena internalizations that is i is a process of transforming the external market with in house links it replaces an external market relationship with a single organization spanning both home and host countries in this way mnc's are able to reduce cross border transaction costs and increase efficiencies mike w peng has observed that fdi essentially transforms the international trade between two independent firms in two countries to intra firm trade between two subsidiaries in two countries controlled by the same mne the mne is thus able to coordinate cross border activities better such advantage is called internalization advantage market imperfections or market failure promotes internalization internalization is a must because fdi provides ownership location and internalization advantages which mnc's otherwise would not obtain the internalization hypothesis is an extension of the market imperfection hypothesis the dynamic capabilities phenomena is associated to resource based views of the firm donald abol etc argued that ownership of specific knowledge or resource is necessary but not sufficient for achieving success in international fdi the firm must also be able to effectively create and exploit dynamic capabilities for quality and or quantity based deployment and these capabilities must be transferable to international environment in order to produce competitive advantage companies typically develop centers of excellence on order to develop distinctive competencies that will be subsequently applied to their investment within the host countries the important point to note is that fdi will materialize only when all these advantages come together Salma Kutishi Stretti has emphasized that MNCs are guided by OLI regarding investment why where and how the ownership advantage mostly determines the why decisions internalization advantages mostly determine the how decision and the location advantages mostly determine the where decisions in this sense and according to the reasoning of Hanert and Park in the year 1994 and Buckley and Cousin in the year 1998 all the advantages are interrelated and affect in particular the likewise consistent decision of why how and where to internalize gracia leto gilles in the year 1992 in her study has criticized dunning's eclectic theory of fdi and observed that it is a taxonomy rather than a theory because it encompasses an array of theories and makes use of large number of variables while emphasizing the role of strategic motivations Gulup Akola 1992 has pointed out that strategic theories include economies of scale the reduction of risk and access to knowledge and expertise all these points highlight the current motivation for mergers and acquisitions RBI in its recent research study in the year 2012 prepared by the division of international trade and finance of the department of economic and policy research has stressed that these theories mainly explain the supply side of fdi that creates a push to fdi for flowing out of the home economy broadly these factors and motives comprise of first profit expansion through knowledge advantage second lower cost advantage third greater market access fourth gains from scale economies fifth strategic motives such as acquiring input supplies or creating worldwide near to monopoly power sixth locational advantages seventh reduction in risk and eighth agglomerations gains the rbi study has also noted that demand side factors which pull fdi into a host economy three demand side studies deserve mention and they have been conducted by world bank in the year 1995 blomstrom and coco in the year 1992 
and Muruksen and Venables in the year 1999. These studies have highlighted gains derived by the host country in the form of FDI effects on first competition and efficiency, second leg spillover, third backward and forward linkages, fourth technological, fifth accumulation of knowledge capital, sixth stable flow of funds with no debt servicing obligation attached, seventh greater external market discipline on microeconomic policy and eighth broadening and deepening of national capital markets etc. With the rising presence of MNCs in the global economy, the view on FDI was expanded with the internalization process of FDI that stress on transaction costs propounded by Dunning and Drugman, Horaji and Toyne. The presumption of internalization of FDI recognized the accumulation and internalization of knowledge as the motivation for FDI which bypasses intermediate product market in knowledge. An MNC that expands across borders may be seeking any of a number of specific sources of profit or opportunity. Such motives of FDI are generally classified into six broad groups. First, market seeking. Market seeking investment will be attracted by the size of the local market which depends on the income of the country and its growth rate. Here, high income countries have an obvious advantage in attracting FDI. Even if a country is not big in terms of the size of its market, it can by belonging to a regional union like the European Union attract market seeking investment. In such cases, the size of the market does not depend on the geographical size or the population size. It depends on the income of the people and here the three points to be noted are gain access to new markets or opportunities, follow key customers and compete with key rivals in their own markets. Secondly, efficiency seeking. Efficiency seeking investment will depend on cost considerations that is influenced by infrastructural facilities and labor cost. In modern sectors, however, labor costs are not very important as they account for a small portion of total cost. Most LDCs are deficient in these facilities. In many instances, low wages are accompanied by low levels of productivity. It is the skill levels and technological capabilities that influence the competitiveness of firms and nations. The important point to note here are reduce sourcing and production costs, locate production near customers, take advantage of government incentives and avoid trade barriers. The third, we have resource for asset seeking. Through the process of FDI, asset exploitation and exploration are used as a springboard to acquire strategic resources. Such resources are not available to MNCs at their home and they make attempts to acquire particular types of resources like natural resources or raw material in the host countries. Resource seeking motives stress the search for physical resources such as minerals consist of oil, coal, iron, ore, zinc, copper, etc. and agricultural products consist of rubber, tobacco, sugar, etc. Control over these resources is vital because these constitute an important part of the production. Moreover, adequate skilled unskilled labor force is available at a lower wage with respect to the home country. MNCs establishing permanent presence around the world are seeking access to the resources at the core of their business. In other words, MNCs intend to attain the objectives of accessing raw materials, gaining access to knowledge or other assets, accessing technological and managerial know-how availability in key markets. Positive and supportive aspects of government policies are very conducive for seeking FDI in host countries. Now we have the fourth point that is other location advantages. Such location advantages occur from the clustering of economic activities in certain locations known as agglomerations. Generally, advantages of agglomeration come from knowledge spillovers which create a skilled labor force and demand from industries that facilitate a pool of specialized suppliers and buyers also located in the region. Such advantages propel FDI flows to countries with good infrastructure, large and growing markets, technologically advanced, skilled and competent workforce and those having high-tech firms enjoying goodwill and brand names. Then we have the fifth point that is traffic jumping and interdependence thesis. In the context of developing countries imposing high tariffs on imports to protect domestic industries, MNCs set up production facilities in the host countries to reap benefits of the protection given to domestic industries. The fast-moving consumer goods sector is a salient example of such development. The market power and the oligopoly interdependence model illustrate such development. As it is commonly known, oligopoly conserves 
market shares and competitors are not tolerated to forestall them. Then we have the sixth point that is product life cycle known as PLC. The PLC concept explains that FDI is a natural stage in the life of a product. Raymond Vernon in the year 1966 developed a dynamic stage based approach to FDI to explain the behavior of large US corporations. There is a close relationship between international trade and international investment. The PLC approach states that same firms may move their own production to locations of factor advantages as the products and market mature. The PLC model exemplifies the first, the concept of a technology gap, the second, the initial point in the internationalization process, and the third, foreign locations provide lower cost of production. RBI study has concluded that the theorists such as Host who stressed upon locational determinants of FDI identified prevalence of natural resources as an important factor for FDI flows. Wheeler and Modi identified ergodic and non-ergodic systems that determine the location of FDI. The ergodic system focused on classical variables such as geographical features, labor costs, transport costs and market size as factors determining the FDI flows. Various empirical studies still rely on these variables to determine potential for FDI flows. The non-ergodic system focused on externalities that emerge from investment in firms experiencing agglomeration economies, in other words, indicating the clustering effects of FDI. The studies such as Venable, Spotter, etc. explain spatial patterns of FDI in terms of these factors. To have a fresh glance at all these, a selected list from Morgan and Katsikis in the year 1997 relating to theories of trade and foreign direct investment is presented in table below. The table shows different theories of international trade and investment. From a resource-based perspective, the pursuit of ownership and location advantages can be regarded as MNC's resources and capabilities flexing their muscles in global competition. Himmer pointed out that the nature of FDI and FPI differs and as such same theories cannot be applied to both type of investment. Now we move on to nuances of theories of FDI. In the case of FDI host country perspective may differ markedly from those of foreign investors home country. Dynamic changes in the business environment can largely be attributed to the process of globalization and liberalization. Furthermore globalization is concerned with the process of technological innovation deepening of FDI and expanding trade and financial networks. All the theories or hypothesis in one way or the other relates to one or more motives for FDI. The internalization theory is an extension of the market imperfection theory. However, the internationalization process is more complicated than it appears at first glance. Generally, the FDI investor happens to be a monopolist or an oligopolist in product market. Given this scenario, Hemmer tacitly suggested that government should put regulations on it. International trade and international investments are closely related. The international product life cycle theory explains that FDI is a natural stage in the life of a product. The location of the FDI is determined by both the firm's perception of the uncertainties associated with it and the geographical allocation of its existing assets. The strategic theories have been analyzed by Niggerbocker in the year 1973 and Akosela in the year 1992. The Niggerbockers follow the leader theory is regarded as defensive in nature because competitors are investing to avoid losing the market served by exports when their initial investor begins local production. The reasons behind such strategic alliances include economies of scale, the reduction of risk and access to knowledge and expertise. This also highlights the motivation for mergers and acquisition. The eclectic theory comprising OLI developed by Professor Dunning is a mix of three different theories of FDI. In this way, he has provided the foundation for a common justification of international operations. His loaded conceptual framework highlights not only the level, form and growth of MNC's activity but also the way in which such activities are conducted. Moreover, his paradigm proposes a potent device for analyzing the role of FDI. 
forcing the economic ramifications of MNC's operations and for assessing the level to which the policies of home and host countries are likely both to affect and be affected by these operations. Theories of oligopoly and business strategy explain the probable reaction of firms to specific OLI structure. It is important to remember that two common threats which link nearly all theories or hypotheses and have support of empirical findings are that the major part of FDI is done by large research intensive MNCs in oligopolistic industries and they find it profitable to invest overseas. Donald Leibold etc. have added that all motives can be linked in some way to the desire to increase or product not only profits but also sales and markets. However, identification of determining factor of FDI is a complex problem which depends on several uniqueness specifics for each country, sector and company. According to Valregia Botteric and Lorena Skulf, factors determining FDI can be grouped under three broad heads economic policy, performance and attractiveness of host economy. These factors include host economy size and potential growth, natural resources and domains and quality of workforce, openness to international trade and access to international markets, quality of physical, financial and technological infrastructure. In the same way, the investor motivation for FDI is to acquire better access to markets nationally, regionally and globally competitive labor cost and productivity as well as skills availability, access to raw material at competitive cost and acceptable risk linked to a supportive policy environment and with essential infrastructure consists of utilities, telecommunications and transport. An added justification for FDI relates to proactive and reactive motivational factors. A number of stimuli symbolized by push and pull factors propel firms along the international path. Thus, despite the attempts of researchers, the inevitable conclusions emerges is that the phenomena of FDI is not amenable to a general theory accepted. One only expects that the new universally acceptable theory which is yet to come up will clarify some of the limitations associated with existing theories. Now we are moving on to empirical evidence supporting theories and reasons for non-applicability of theories. There exist a large number of theories that explain the reasons for the movement of international capital. All the empirical results reveal that for FDI there is not a unified theoretical explanation and it seems at this point very unlikely that such a unified theory will emerge. No single theory fits the different type of direct investment or the investment made by a particular multinational corporation or country in any region. The applicability of the theory differs with the type and origin of investment. Nevertheless, all these theories are unanimous in their view that a firm moves abroad to reap the benefits of the advantages in the form of location, firm specific or internationalization of markets. During framework of ownership, location and internalization that is OLI and several recent theories helps to understand the drivers for FDI. In modern times, FDI outflows from emerging economies such as unknown in the global context. It is important to note that MNCs in these countries do not have the kind of competitive ownership advantage of quality, technology, etc. in the global context. Their global expansion through global footprint and access to technology and resources as explained in the linkage, leverage and learning that is LLL framework by Matthews and Ravi Subramaniam etc. have observed that their basis of competition in the global arena is different from that of Bioning. The triple L framework is quite successful in explaining the arguments for the East Asian economies of Malaysia, Korea, Hong Kong and outflows from India are quite dif different from East Asia economies both structurally and intertemporally. FDI outflows from India have accelerated only in the last decade post liberalization while those from East Asia have been taking place for more than 20 years. Government policies in India as well as strong domestic growth are some of the key factors which have given confidence to some empirical studies. They have highlighted the fact that a part of investment can be considered defensive in nature. Another motive for FDI is the desire for reduced risk through diversification. This risk is related to political instability 
or the threats of adverse political development at home. Thus, government policies at home are one of the common motives for emerging economies of MNCs to invest abroad. The restrictive nature of policies of home government exerting pressure on firms to invest abroad. For example, in the pre-1990s period, large privately owned Indian firms that were desperate to expand their operations found themselves in a bind due to disadvantageous situation created by a restrictive policy regime. Another driver of FDI has been the role of diaspora. Such ethnic networks play a transitional role in matching the right supplier and seller in international markets. They particularly enjoy a favorable position in their country of origin which allows them to serve as bridges between the economies of the country of origin and the host country. This is particularly evident in case of investment by Indian MNCs which have usually gone to countries and regions having sizable Indian migrant communities. During 1999 to 2008, the leading recipient of Indian outward FDI in the OECD region were Canada, UK and the USA. These countries happen to have the largest concentration of Indian diaspora. The currency-based theory of FDI also provides an explanation for foreign investment by emerging economies. If the domestic currency is relatively stronger than foreign currency, it will be advantageous for firms to go abroad. It is well to remember that there are certain motives which drive emerging economies firms and that sets them apart from those MNCs that have their headquarters in developed countries. As such, to understand foreign direct investment, one must first understand the basic motivations that cause a firm to invest abroad. The main concern of all the theories of FDI is to provide an explanation of the reason for a firm's decision to invest abroad. Some of the theories are a corollary to trade theories. Despite their different approaches, these theories are unanimous in their view that a firm moves abroad to reap the benefit of advantage enjoyed by them in the form of location, firm specific or internationalization of markets. These theories also articulate the fact that government policies on the domestic economy also play a vital role in encouraging international investment by the firms. Some theories have also propounded a link between regional trade agreements and FDI. However, in this context, it is relevant to note that the majority of theories are in context of developed world multinationals. In recent years, the growing importance of emerging economies, MNCs has necessitated the modification of these theories in order to incorporate such features as labor disputes in the home country, lower expatriate cost, familiarity with local conditions in other countries and the role of diaspora. Although several researchers have tried to explain the phenomena of FDI, yet one cannot say that there is a generally accepted theory. Every new evidence adding some new elements and criticism to the previous ones. All in all, it might not be possible to reach some point of total knowledge that can be captured in one single theory of FDI. Nevertheless, several parts of the different theories might find their way into new venture theory. It is also important to note that a falsification of the theories does not mean that there is no truth in the reasoning behind them. Therefore, to find a new model or theory, researchers should now take into account dramatic improvements in the computer, communication and transportation technology significantly decrease the cost of international business for every type of company. Process innovations allowed the production of non-standardized low-scale goods. Barriers to international trade were removed. International markets were integrated. Access to funding widened. Thus, the primary enablers of FDI were the political economy and the advance of technology. Now we are going to make a summary of what we have discussed so far. First, FDI theories focus on the motives of MNC's FDI. Generally, FDI theories do not include the scale and quality of investment. Secondly, the host country's concerns are somewhat different from the MNC's concern. Thirdly, John Dunning has provided a comprehensive analysis of FDI based on ownership, location and the internationalization that is OLI paradigm properly known as eclectic paradigm. Fourthly, eclectic paradigm states that FDI takes place in different situations like the MNCs possesses ownership advantage that is O that are not available to the host country firms. Locational advantage that is L in the host country is more profitable or easier than exporting to that country. 
and internalization advantage that is i when the mnc's exploit their ownership advantages rather than sold directly through spot market or offer to other firms through contractual arrangements such as licensing the establishment of joint ventures or managerial contracting first buckley and casson in the year 1976 conceptualized the internalization theory internalization that is i is a general encompassing theory which can explain fdi the market imperfections approach to fdi is typically referred to as internalization theory this refers to the replacement of cross border markets such as exporting and importing with one firm that is the mnc locating in two or more countries fdi provides one of the best ways to facilitate extension of firm specific resources and capabilities abroad then sixth we have two things are essential for internalization firstly mnc's would choose the least cost location and secondly the firms would internalize until the cost outweighed the benefits external market transactions like buying and selling technology through licensing are replaced by internalization then seventh we have product life cycle this theory is developed by vernon in the year 1966 it is used to explain certain types of foreign direct investment vernon believes that there are four stages of production cycles that is innovation growth maturity and decline this theory explains certain types of investment made by mncs which possess the technological advantage the eight mncs pursue fd policy for complex and overlapping reasons it is worthwhile to categorize specific motives into three that is market seeking motives resource or asset seeking motives and efficiency seeking motives in any one venture several motives may apply simultaneously with one or more dominate than other then finally we have discussed appropriate policies appear to be a necessary precondition for attracting fdis which relates to the issues of creating investor friendly environment for fdi quite a large number of researchers have highlighted the role played by policy environment